All right, cool. Well, let's get with um, um, our guest of honor. <laughs> I want to bring on my man, Kevin Lewis. Kevin is uh, been a joy to watch um, join our business and and just really kick butt. And it, <clears throat> I love his testimonial. I, I sent out a testimony video, so I hope you got a chance to watch it, you know, because the way he came in and, you know, kind of his thought process of getting in, retired army. And uh, um, so we definitely thank him for his service. And uh, so I'm gonna bring him on, man. Kevin has got a lot of great stuff to share. I'll, pro I'll prompt you, Kevin, with questions too. But um, let's uh, bring on my man, Kevin. So. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> there he is. Go Army. <laughs> Go Army. Kevin, uh, by the way, Kevin is the man with the bow tie. He has a bow tie business. Okay. So he's always promoting his business. And um, uh, you could probably write those ties off because you wear, you wear them. You're advertising. I would think it's an advertising cost myself absolutely absolutely <laughs> and um and yes underneath that beard is this handsome young man that uh it's really cool to see a picture of you like i think with your i think i saw with your army me mess dress on or whatever you call that and um yeah. all clean shaven it was like wow <laughs> that must be how james harden looks i'm thinking <laughs> yeah after 20 years of shaving every single day, I promised myself I'm never shaving like that again. So <laughs> I know the beard is here to stay. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it looks good on you, dude. Thanks, but, sir. Um, Thank you. So you're um, so tell us about your background, like arm, tell us about your army background, and then how did you find the alliance? So I um I'm an engineer officer. I was an engineer officer. Um I, uh, I commissioned out of Jackson State in Jackson, Mississippi into the Engineer Corps. Um, I was in the conventional army for uh, four or five years and I moved over and started doing some, um, some interesting things. I had, I had a lot of fun uh, doing a lot of demolitions um, and deployed a bunch of times. And then after uh, at 20 years, uh, family and I decided it was time to hang it up. Um, I, I had um, done everything that, I, that I, uh, I wanted to do. I did have higher aspirations at one point. Um, but it was time to put the family first and um, and put the army to the back seat. And so I decided to retire. Uh, but as I was retiring, I did um, what was called the senior leader intern program that the army has. And um, and I, I interned with this company uh, where I got my securities licenses and my health and life license. But I really wasn't um, enthusiastic about going to work for that company. Um, so and I had a couple of surgeries. So I was, I was sitting at home healing up. And, uh, and I got a call from Mike's recruiter, uh, Paige Higdon. She and I are good friends now. Mike um, Leventovich, right? Yes, Mike Leventovich. Um, but I got a call and I was sitting at home relaxing. And uh, I got a call from, from this young lady. And she was like, hey, we have an opportunity you might be interested in. And uh, I was a little flippant at first. But then, <laughs> you know, something clicked in me and said, hey, um, this is probably an opportunity that you at least should entertain. And I did. And I met Mike. Um, we talked on the phone for a few days and then I, I went and met him in person. He was in Louisville. I was in Louisville. Um, and then we went to a hot spot with Stephen Davies and a couple of other people. And, uh, and I was like, all right, this is legit. I, I might want to give this a chance. And that was um, August of last year, August of 21. Um, and I had another surgery. So I was out almost all of September. Um, but I really started full time in October, October last year. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's been a fun ride. Crazy thing about how short a time you've been with us and kind of the um, elevation of your career with us in such a <clears throat> expeditious manner. By the way, Paige Higdon, gang, she was, that's the gal that taught us how she dials the phone. So we had Paige on here, Kevin, um, I think it was last week. No, it was a week before last. And she did a great job on phone dialing. So that's the same gal that called Kevin. So there's, you know, yeah. you can see the kind of the thread. You can imagine Paige has got this personality, just really a great personality. And then she pulled me she, in. She got me. <laughs> she got you. But you know what? I think so everyone kind of has this when you're presented with the opportunity, what happens is you you're evaluating it. You're determining, OK, is this real? And then are these people real? 
is this something then then is it is it if it's real then is this something i can do and you kind of like you came to things that helped you walk down that road of belief right you got around different people you talk to people other than mike you know other folks you kind of surround yourself with the the evidence right that this business is a successful business didn't you absolutely i um and so you know that first meeting i went to with stephen davies mike you know i came home and told my wife about it and she was like all right if you're going to do it do it and so then i went to mike and i I said hey whatever you tell me to do i'm gonna do it for three months i'm gonna give you october november and december and we'll see how it rocks and um and the first thing he told me to do was get to a family reunion uh 21 and i was like man i just had surgery i came up with all these excuses why and my wife was like nope we're doing it i'll drive let's go (laughs) um and so we drove to north carolina and i went to family reunion and it's crazy like that same thought process you said you said was you know is this real is this legit and the more people i got around the more i kind of felt like all right this might be okay um and then i said well can i be successful at it and and october november december i think october i did around eight thousand issue paid and i was like all right and i started getting those first paychecks and my wife was like oh like you're not selling drugs to get this money like (laughs) (laughs) and um and then in November, I did uh, 21,000 issue paid, which was pretty awesome. And, and I followed up, I think December, I did around 18. Um, so, you know, after October, I was already all in. But after those three months, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm never working anywhere else. Like, this, this is it. <laughs> and so I asked you this before on, the, on your testimony of video, but I'm going to ask it again. Like, you're an Army officer, dude. What, you were an engineer. What was your major, mechanical engineering? Uh, civil. Civil. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. You're civil well, engineering. Undergrad was computer science and mathematics. Oh. <laughs> my master's degree is in civil. So, oh, okay. <laughs> let me let me yeah. let me push my glasses up my nose. <laughs> Seriously, nerd. Dude? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very much so. Okay, you need you need it. these big glasses because I'm looking at you <laughs> now like Urkel. Urkel without the glasses, dude. You're like this. For sure. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so um, So that does not tell me, bro, that you are a sales guy. Like, I don't see sales in any of that. What made you think that that you could, well, number one, I would think that maybe you had this interest in finance and, you know, maybe something like that, but actually selling a product to some other person, you know, what made you think that you could do that, that part? I didn't. I didn't see myself. I still don't see myself as a salesman. (laughs) Um, like I, I sat with a, a family today and they were like, man, you know, we had a guy come in here last week and he just tried to push all these products on him, on us. And, and they were like, you actually act like you care. And I was like, no, nah, it's not an act. Um, like I, I genuinely feel like wh- whoever I'm with, I'm completely dialed in and focused on that, that family that I'm sitting with. So I don't see myself as a salesman. I see myself as providing a service. Yes, but I care. Um, and so, you know, that first month as I'm sitting with clients and I have no idea what I'm doing, I was just interested in their story. And I'm like, you know, I'm a people person. I can talk to anybody. So I'm like, you know, just let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. And as that, you know, turned into dollars on my bank account, I was like, oh, well, this is something that I can do. I was more concerned about, can I replicate it? Is this yeah. replicatable? And, you know, getting to conferences and going to NatCon January of this year, um, gave me more tools in my kit bag. And I was like, oh, bet it's on now. Yeah, like they've yeah. given me scripts. They've told me like, you know, going to conference, I can't say this enough, but going to conferences where I learned to say what I say in the home. Like I didn't make anything up. I heard somebody else. I heard Marcus Richardson on stage. I talked to Megan Wood a lot about how to door knock. I talked to Paige about how to, you know, how to dial. I talked to all these people and I just picked their brain and said, what do you say? Like, I don't care how much money you make. I don't care. What do you say when you're in the home? And Marcus Richardson spent like 30 minutes. of was like, hey, this is what I say. This is how I get over objections, whatever, whatever. And so I was like, all right, whatever you told me, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I've done. Just replicate it. Do it over and over again. See, here's the beautiful thing about conferences like Family Reunion and National Conference coming up in December or January. And all the different conferences that we do, we do four a year. And it's true what Kevin says. So when he alludes to those, you know, we have, we might have a room full of a thousand agents and only the top agents get to talk. They get to teach, but here's the key. It's not only the people on stage, it's the top agents that are 
right next to you, sitting next to you. You might be sitting next to somebody and it's like, aren't you Marcus Richardson? Yeah. Hey. And you just start talking to them. They're just like, right. They're normal people. And you're talking to these top producers and they're giving you their best. And then Kevin's already experienced when people come up to him and they go, dude, how'd you make 97,000 in a month? And in his humble way, he'll tell them everything he's doing. He doesn't hold back. You know, he might slip in a, you know, I think maybe my bow tie, I got some bow ties I can say that will help you too. But hey, he'll give you all the secrets, man. And that's the beautiful thing about the business. So guess what? Marcus Richardson is not in my organization, but guess what? Marcus served one of the people in my group so that he can grow. And do you think that I will hesitate at helping anybody not in my group? Man, I am going to help everybody because that's the Alliance culture, right? Right, Kevin? Yes, sir. So one of the things, I got two quick stories. Um, the first person outside of our hierarchy that I met was Terry Edwards. I am not good at walking up to people and introducing myself. I can talk to anybody if somebody else in initiates. And so Terry Edwards saw me. Uh, we're in the same fraternity and I was wearing a backpack and he walked up to me. Um, we hugged, we talked. It was great. It was a great 10 minute conversation. That was before family reunion. I was just standing there. I was milling about before the conference. He came up and talked to me and he was the first person on stage and I almost fell out my chair. I was like, oh my God, like he spent 10 minutes talking to me. He didn't know where, where I was from, what my organization, like he cared about me as an individual. Um, and so the second story is Alex, when you texted me, I don't know what phone number I have in my phone for you, but it wasn't the number you texted me. All I got was, hey, I have a, 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 a Zoom call this, uh, this Tuesday. Would you mind jumping on and talking to some folks for me? I had no idea who the text was until I logged on and saw it was you. And so I was like, sure. And I think that speaks to the, the willingness of so many people poured into me to get me to where I am, I'll jump on any Zoom at any time for anybody in the Alliance because it's that important to me to pour into anyone else who needs the assistance. Yeah. I had no idea that you were <laughs> you were texting me. I got to ask, save that number because I thought you were just some random person who was like, hey, I got a couple people. I want you to talk to them. I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> I love that, dude. I totally love that. It was like a... Um, talk about a reveal, right? All of a sudden I come on the line. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay, it's Alex. <laughs> well, look, you are you really epitomize what the Alliance is all about when it comes to serving and helping. And I think it's probably a reflection of your service in the military and your, you know, what it comes down to it, you know, we try to find people at the core have a heart to care for other people. I mean, when you look at people, all the top producers that are successful, We'll talk about how much they love their clients. You know, it's here's the it's, here's the analogy. It's like, <clears throat> you know, Tiger Woods. If you ask him, tell us about the Masters in um, you know 1995 when you you know finished second. Tell me about the 17th hole. He'll tell you exactly what happened on the 17th hole, and he'll remember every detail and every shot. You know, it's that kind of you know that kind of mentality, and it and what, how that translates here is that we are the same way in terms of what we're going to do to help people and, and um, that whole attention to detail. And, um, and I think that's, uh, you're a great example of that. So let's go back to when you got started, because we've got a lot of new agents, dude, on this. And some are thinking, golly, man, I'd love to get a start like that. So, you know, we always say that, you know, don't try to think for yourself. We've already done the thinking for you you know, work on our thought process, not your own. We say that a gazillion times, but then, you know, there's only a few people that actually do that. Like when you make recommendations, like, you know, you really ought to be the boot camp down in Louisville. And I tell all my new people that, and then, you know, four people show up. It's like, rock on. I fired about the four people and I feel super sorry for the people that didn't make it to get around those other folks. Like how fanatical were you at doing everything that Mike said? And then what did Mike say to you to get you to do all the things that you did? All right. So I'm going to caveat all of this. And I, I don't want, I want to, you know, be fully transparent is that I was able to go all in because I was still on active duty and I was healing up from surgery. So I was still drawing a paycheck. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't want to be disingenuous and say, Hey, I knew I could do this and I was broke at home. You know, that's Hutch Hutchison. Like he was broke when he started. So yeah. he had that drive. 
my drive is more internal in terms of I'm going to be as, as good as I can at whatever I try to do. But once I told Mike that I was all in and I said, hey, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. So the first thing he told me to do is he said, hey, I got this stack of leads. And he didn't tell me that they were, you know, five, 10 year old leads. They were <laughs> aged, ancient leads. He just said, I want you to go downstairs because uh, at the time he had an upstairs and downstairs in the office. I want you to go downstairs to the dungeon and I want you to dial all of them. And he said, dial them three times. If you get three connects and you don't make a, an appointment, come up and talk to me. Got three connects, no appointment. Went upstairs and talked to Mike. So, you know, it's the taking instruction and then being able to be humble enough to go say, hey, I suck at this. And, you know, one of the learning points is everybody sucks when they first start. That's right. You know, even though I had a very fast start out the blocks, um, I sucked. Like I look back at my first appointment where I wrote an application. I'm like, man, I was terrible. It was absolutely <laughs> terrible. It was a year ago. and I remember it. And um, but also so, you know, once I I sat down there and I dialed for like four hours and I made, I think, six or seven appointments, I was ecstatic. I was like, oh, this works. And then come to find out like, hey, you know, six appointments in four hours. That's not really good at all. But I didn't know. <laughs> Right. And so I think, you know, not having expectations, just right. putting in effort, putting in work. And I didn't I wasn't on Facebook. I wasn't spending time doing anything that was going to distract me from what my goal was, was Mike told me to dial every single one of those leads. And I did. And I booked those appointments. Then he said, hey, when you go run these appointments, call me when you need me in the appointment before you write an application. And he called me afterwards. I called Mike probably 100 times. <laughs> like I called him up so much that I worried that I was calling him too much. <laughs> and, you know, and so, you know, I wrote an application at the first house I went to. And I remember him telling me, he was like, ah, I kind of wish it didn't because it's going to set your expectations too high. But I wrote that first, I wrote two actually for husband and wife. Yeah. And then I didn't write anything for like another week and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> but I knew once I got that first, you know, four or 500 bucks in my bank account, I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then I came with the knowledge of an IUL. So I came in with IUL knowledge because I already had my securities licenses. Yeah. And so then I just started writing IULs and I hit up, you know, there is no pressure to hit your family and friends, but I believe in the IUL. I believe in the product. So of course I, I was like, all right, everybody is getting this IUL. So That's I went right. to all my family first in October. And then that started to show up in November. That's why October was about 8,000, but November kind of took off because I, all those IULs hit. In yeah. November, and I was just replicating it. But I think another thing that Mike taught me was be coachable and be teachable. And one of the things he said was, You need to get to every conference. And I was like, All right, you know, once I said I'm in, I'm in. You know, I had a little bit of doubt at first, but once I'm in, I, I saw the value of getting to the conference and being around other people and, and getting, you know, for me, the conferences have three parts, right? Um, and you might disagree with this, Alex, but. I'll say four parts, but three parts on stage. So there's the recognition piece. Everybody getting recognized. I was like, that's going to be me. I'm going to be on that stage next year. Cool. Recognition. I loved it. Um, the second piece was the motivation and people getting up and telling their stories. I didn't need that. I didn't need it at all. Like I'm internally motivated. People getting up, you know, just to be honest, people getting up and telling their story didn't do much for motivating me because yeah. I didn't need that. Yeah. But the third piece was somebody getting up and saying, this is what I say when I'm in the home. This is what I say when I'm you know, on the phone. This is a product you need to know. This is what an IUL is. This is what an annuity is. This is how you can use BAM. All of those things they taught us at the conference. But better than any of that is what you said. Sitting down to somebody, having no idea that they're one of the top producers in the country, and being able to ask very detailed questions and say, you know, well, what happens when somebody says this? Or how do I get an annuity through? Or how do I do this? How do I do that? You know, and me sitting next to Marcus Richardson for an hour and a half during a presentation, you know, I wasn't paying attention to that presentation at all. That's right. I was just asking him <laughs> every question I could think of. <laughs> but that wouldn't have happened if I had not dedicated myself right. to spending the, the, I think it was like 300 bucks to go to NatCon last year. Yeah. I was like, all right, whatever. Like I just made like $15,000 in December. Like, <laughs> cool let's go you know so it was um you know mike he, he was really adamant about me getting around as many people as possible every time there was a hot spot within driving distance i'm driving um every time megan wood had something up in indianapolis which is like a three-hour drive from louisville 
I'm on the road and I'm getting up there because she's the number one producer. Why wouldn't I get around her and try to pick her brain while I'm there? Um, and so I think, you know, getting immersed in the environment is the best thing I can tell any new agent. Get around people who are successful. Like it, it, it can't be replicated. No, man. I tell you what, what's great about you is that even with all your success, retired military, you know, college degree, master's degree, I mean, all the accolades of someone who would be um, financially successful, you would think, because of your education. And then you humble yourself at the feet of a server bartender, worked at Applebee's for 13 years, never made more than 40000 a year, single mother, who, and former drug addict, eating disorder. I mean, every possible challenge in her life, she becomes the number one producer. And you're at you're sitting at her feet trying to get nuggets from her. Isn't that the beauty of this business is that you can humble yourself and it's not based on, you know, it's just she knows more than you. You're just gonna pick her brain, right? Ask a million questions. I don't give a damn what her background That's is. That's right. Like <laughs> I want to get to where you are. So, you know, that's the path. And, you know, you can you can be pompous. You can have the attitude of I am not going to subject myself to somebody who's beneath me. But that's a loser's attitude. Totally. Right. Like you won't you, you won't be successful in life with that attitude. Like none of my clients care that I have a master's degree in, in engineering. Like no, nobody nobody cares. None of my clients care that I, you know, I have all of these things. I got 43 jump. Nobody cares about any of that. It's do I care about them? Right. And that's, yeah. you know, I didn't start out like that. I learned that from somebody. Like, I think Mike taught me that he was like, Hey, you know, nobody cares about you until you care about them. Yeah. And absolutely. so be genuinely interested and care about the clients. And so, you know, that learning and that time that I spent around Megan, like, yeah, her story is amazing. <laughs> but for me, what can I learn from her? Right. What can I glean when I spend time with her? Like when I door knock, I didn't make up my door knock script. When Megan you know, she sat down with me and we talked for about an hour and I said, hey, give me your door knock script. And she and I wrote it down word for word. I said it over and over again until I have it memorized. Like, it's, it's that simple. Like, and, you know, I would not have got that if I, like you said, if I wouldn't have humbled myself and say, you know, what, I'm about to make this three hour drive to go sit down with this bartender lady um, who who's going to teach me how to be successful in this business. Um, it's powerful. It is, man. I, I love that, that attitude. And that's why you've accelerated so quickly is you didn't dare to question people that had their financial interest in you because Mike didn't make any money unless you were making money, right? So why would you even question anything that he'd recommend? Because he'd be hurting himself and his family if he told you something that wouldn't work, right? Now, let me tell you how stupid I am. Alex. Yeah, I didn't know any of that when I started. I, did, I had no idea how anybody made money. I, I didn't know that Mike made a percentage off anything I did. Let me tell you how how uh, how ignorant I am. So I met Mike, and for a week we talked um, face to face. Whatever yeah. we went, we were we were together for about a week, and then we drove down to the um, to the hot spot where Stephen Davies and a couple other guys were, and they went through the whole briefing, and they were talking about the industry, and I was all ears. I was like, "This is amazing. This is a great experience. It's a great opportunity." And then they said, "All right, we're going to welcome to the stage the guy who's made a million dollars a year the past 15 years in a row off residual income, and he's going to tell you how to recruit to do it." And Mike was sitting next to me, and I'm I'm like I'm leaning forward. I'm like, "All right, a million dollars a year, I'm with it. Let's talk." And Mike gets up, and I'm again, I almost fell out of my chair, and I was like, "You mother sucker! Like <laughs> I've been with you for a week, and you never once told me that you make a million dollars off residual income." And so, you know, for me. It's not necessarily about the dollar amount. It's about that million dollars equates to one success. He's very successful at what he does. And then that translates to the number of people who he's helping. And, you know, I just I didn't know enough to know enough that, you know, Mike had a financial interest in me being successful or that all these other people were willing to pour into me and they didn't have a financial interest. Like I was just like, I am amazed at this, this opportunity. And so I'm jumping in feet first. Like, yeah. hey, let's go. Let's get it. Wow. So I had the pleasure of meeting your lovely wife um, at the last boot camp, and she was a trip, Kendra, right? Yep. And delightful. I mean, it was like, okay, I could see how you two are together. You know, there's parts <laughs> like, okay, I get it. She's awesome. Like, she's got this, this thing about her. She just, anyway, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Anyway, so when you got in this thing, 
um, or when you got into financial service, because you did, you started getting financial services. How was she, as far as you making the decision, kind of deciding, okay, this is what I'm going to do, you know, and then there's the alliance and how, how did she come along to everything? Was she skeptical? Was she always positive and supportive? Like what, what, tell, tell me about her journey. Um, so we're really big on our name. Um, so we're the K Lewis's, all of us, our name starts with K. Um, and so our name means something. And so when, when I started and I told Mike, I was going to do whatever he told me. And then I kind of was waffling a little bit. She was like, no, our name means something. Um, so you got to wow. follow through. You shouldn't have told him that if you didn't mean it. Um, but she was skeptical. She was like, ah, I don't know if it's going to work. It's not a traditional nine to five. But once that first paycheck hit, it was like, all right, now we're, we're doing this. We're you're, doing or, this. you're doing this. <laughs> um, and she wasn't all in until she went to NatCon last year. Um, and so then that, that prompted her to go get her license. But um, she was one, Kendra will support whatever I do. So it wasn't a question of does she support right, it? Right. It was a question of, is this real? Um, and like, I've made more money this year than I made as a senior lieutenant colonel with 20 years experience in the army. Like, hey, wow. the, the amount of money that I've made this year is ridiculous. And I took three months off. We took the summer off to, you know, <laughs> celebrate retirement and, <laughs> and move, right? Move to Birmingham. Yeah, and move. And I've issued paid almost 300,000, which is ridiculous. <laughs> like that is, that's utterly okay. ridiculous. And so, you know, but she's been by my side, you know, four deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, 20 years in the army. We've been together since we were freshmen in college. So it's never been a question of, of her supporting me. It's just, it was just a question is, is this legit? Is this, you know, is this fake? Is it like, is yeah. it some scheme or anything like that? Um, but once we started seeing the money roll in and started seeing the structure of the business, she was all in. Yeah, that's awesome, dude. I love that. Okay, so you know the you are Mr. IUL in our organization. You are um, you've been writing some really monster policies. So there's a lot of new agents don't even know they can't even spell IUL. They don't even know what that stands for. So kind of give us a rundown on why did that product intrigue you. Tell, tell the new people what that is. You know, we're not, don't teach it, but tell them what it is. And then right. what, what intrigued you about it? And then how do you work that into a conversation when you're sitting down with someone, you know, if they're looking for final expense, mortgage protection, whatever, all of a sudden that conversation comes up. So talk about your journey and learning and understanding IUL. So when I got my securities licenses, one of the things that turned me off from the company that I was um, interning with is we had to learn all about these other products, VULs, IULs. Uh, IUL stands for indexed universal life. VUL stands for variable universal life. Um, you have to have a securities license to sell a VUL. You don't have to have anything but a life insurance license to sell an IUL. Um, but their biggest thing was, hey, you have to learn this to get your license, but we don't, we don't sell it to clients. We don't, we don't market anything to clients um, just because we don't make enough money from it as an organization. And so I was like, ah, that sucks, but all right, whatever. <laughs> um, but IUL basically is a retirement vehicle for you to put money in um, after tax dollars that aren't limited like a 401k or a Roth IRA. It's not limited. You don't have contributions yearly limits on it. And you can dump a bunch of money into it and it grows tax free. And then when you start taking distributions from it, um, they're all tax free um, and, and it's a beautiful vehicle. And there's a life insurance policy attached to it. So when you die, your loved ones get a good chunk of money. Um, and so I saw that as a very viable source to get, um, you know, some generational traction going to start building some, right. some long term wealth. And so the first thing I did, of course, is if I believe in it, I got to get it myself. Um, so I got one for me, my wife, my sons, yeah. and my brother one. And it, it really took off from there. And I think um, and, you know, the way I do it is a lot different is I don't, um, so when I'm sitting there, I only do final expense. Um, I have a GMR, uh, a, uh, I have my leads coming. Uh, I only do leads in final expense. Yeah. Um, so I don't get my IUL clients um, from those leads, uh, but it really happened through one market. And so I told two or three of my friends about the IUL. I gave them a presentation. Gina Hawks worked with me to create my own presentation. And I created this presentation. I'll send it to anybody who wants it. Uh, um, yeah, send but, it to me. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I, um, I told a couple of friends and then they have been my biggest advocate. And I think what, you know, the lesson, again, the lesson for everyone is if you are generally, you know, 
if you are genuine and you're you're wanting to help people, other people are going to flock to that. And so I wrote for two or three people and then they told two or three people. So right now um, I get a text, probably two or three texts a week from random people say, hey, I got your information from such and such. They said, you're really good with this retirement planning stuff. Um, I, I want to set up a meeting so we can talk about it. And um, and that, you know, I do worry that that's not sustainable. Um, but as long as it's coming, it's coming. It's uh, coming. Yeah. And so, you know, eventually, if it does dry up, I will move into the mortgage protection leads and start having conversations about it. But my question whenever I'm in the home is always, how's your retirement going? Um, or what's your retirement plan? And uh, I don't know if you guys say if anybody on the call has ever played the question game, but I play the question game like a madman. Yeah. I just ask and I, I just ask questions and I just ask question after question after question and I shut up and listen. And what I'm trying to do is find out as much as I can about the client. And then I'm asking questions to kind of neck them down into a conversation that I want to have about, you know, tax free retirement income. How can I help you generate tax free retirement income? Let's talk about it. And, and that's where the IUL swoops right in and it sells itself. Once you once you have a conversation with somebody about it, it, it really writes itself. An application is simple. Um, it's just a, a very simple process, but it's being willing to ask the question, um, being willing to step out and say, you know what? All they can do is tell me no. Like they right. can't punch me in the face or anything stupid <laughs> like that. All they, can, all they can do is say no. And that's OK. Um, yeah. And, you know, once somebody says no, OK, on to the next one. You know, what's so. interesting about the IUL sales process, way different than life insurance, because life insurance is ma mainly centered around death benefit and premium amount they can afford. When you're talking IUL, it's how much can you put into this account to help it grow? It's how much can you put back every month? It's not, it's more of a maximization equation than it is minimum, minimum premium equation, right? <laughs> Yes, sir. So like uh, I, an analogy I have is when I sit down with a client and I'm doing final expense and I always write down three different options and I am always amazed because 90 percent of the time people choose the middle one. Right. Right. But I'm always amazed when that one client is like, no, nah, I'll take the top one. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, and that happened to me today. Like I wrote down uh, for a final expense, 15, 20 and 25. And the client was like, um, what if I want 30 or 40? I was like, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, let's do it. But the IUL is the same kind of conversation. It's like, well, how much can you, you know, what's the maximum amount you can contribute um, that won't, you know, impact you right now that'll help set you up for the long term future? So I tell everyone is how much are you contributing to your 401k right now? All right, let's stop doing that idiocracy and let's move it all to an IUL right. plus some. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's my starting point is, you know, you should be investing at least 10% of your income right now. So if you're making 100,000, Hey, you should be contributing 10% a year, right? Yeah. That's that's my That's what I was going to ask you about the um if you use the actual income percentage um um uh approach. So it sounds like you do. I do. Yeah. I use and I say 10% and I always say hey, you know, the book and I always I always say the book. The book says you got to, you know, you should be investing 10% to set yourself up for retirement. But we all know that with the time value of money, that might not be enough. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you are contributing 10% to your retirement, what does it look like if you contribute more? Um, and can you afford to contribute more? And you probably should be contributing more. Yeah. And then I show them what it looks like in an IUL illustration if they do contribute more. And I say, you know, my recommendation has to be matched with your reality. If your reality is you want to maintain your same standard of living in retirement that you have right now, you need to invest more um, and you need to contribute of such to set you up for your retirement. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me interject because <clears throat> the time value money is real important and you're talking, okay, so I'm, I'm a master's in economics. So I'm a, I'm a real nerd, right? So when people on the, on Facebook are saying, I just made, I just made this guy, guy's child a millionaire in 40 years, they're going to have a million dollars in their IUL. It's like, dude, at a 4% inflation rate, do you know that's about $240,000 in today's dollars? Yeah, that's, like, yeah bro, it's, not, it's not much. It's four, you need to get that child to $4 million if you're going to make a dent for to make retirement meaningful. You know, it's that, that idea, right? But you, know, you obviously got to work with, within someone's budget. But, but I love the way that you approach this because you're really looking 
Number one, it's their best interest. Number two, we, you and I know that it beats the snot out of 401ks up and down all day long. And I don't care if they match. You can do a spreadsheet analysis. And even with the matching, we can still show how an IUL will outperform a 401k all day long, right? So Every single time. So give us some um, educational resources. Like what are some of your favorite books for like a new agent to want to start understanding, you know, IULs? What are like some of your favorite books? Well, I think one of the first things I did was I, I talked to Gina Hawks. And so yeah. I'm walking to my library real quick. All right. Um, but I, I talked to Gina Hawks um, and and she spent invaluable time with me. Um, my son is in here. Um, but she spent invaluable time with me um, teaching me everything I need to know. And then she recommended some books. So the first one is Safe Money, um, The Roadmap uh, to Retirement. And that's an alliance um, book. You can get that through the It alliance. is an alliance book. Yep. Um, and I don't know if this one, uh, this one's a little ratty, um, but safe, smarter, not harder. Um, this is the second one that I go to. Um, I'm not sure if this is, yeah, this is an Alliance book too. Yeah. Um, and then ugh, the millionaire manual and I have a bunch of pages bookmarked and stuff, but, um, the millionaire manual, um, um, and those are all Alliance books. Let me see what else I have. Oh, growth without risk. Yeah. Yes. This is the one. Um, I think this was the first one I read. Um, and this is not an Alliance book. Um, I don't know who gave me this. I but think you can Mike gave it to the me. Alliance bookstore. Oh, okay. The Alliance bookstore. Um, but yeah, those are, are the ones that I read starting out and I, I'm an avid reader. Um, but uh, I, I poured through those starting out and I had already known about the IUL, but I didn't know how to sell it or how to pitch it. Yeah. And those kind of gave me the, the insights I needed to, to make it um, palatable for, for my clients. Um, Cause one thing you can't do is you can't go in and, and speak in big, no. big words and, and, no. <laughs> and overanalyze it for them. No, you got to break it down and make sure that they understand it on the childlike level. Um, and you know, that's what Gina Hawks really helped me do is say, hey, man, you can't you can't think that the, the clients are going to have all the intimate knowledge that you have. You can't talk to them like like they know how the market works or any of that. Yeah. Um, you got to break it down Barney style for them. Absolutely. Barney style. I like that. That's cool. Well, dude, I, you know, I appreciate uh, appreciate you so much. Anybody have any questions for Kevin? You got the man right here. I think everyone can still unmute. Oh, I <laughs> no, they can't. Now they can. All right. Anyone have any questions for Kevin? Hey, what's going on, Kevin? I mean, I, I got one question for you. Uh, how long did it feel for you to be comfortable doing what you're doing in like uh, your field? I'm you're muted, Kevin. I didn't feel comfortable and probably until probably like three or four months ago when I started um, hiring people and Mike started pushing people to call me from the home. Right. And so, you know, in this business, um, you don't have to know anything when you're starting out. And I didn't realize how much I knew until a new agent called me and said, hey, I need some help. I'm in the home. I'm sitting with, you know, Barry and Susan. And these are the, the medicines that they take. And I was able to rattle it off without even having to look it up. Oh, no, you can't go Mutual of Omaha. That, that, that'll knock them out. Um, we're going to have to go CVS. And I was like, damn, I really do know this stuff. And that's when I kind of said, hey, you know, I do know this stuff better than I know. And I think my wife was in the car with me. And I was like, I think I, think I know this stuff a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, the, the thing, though, is you should never be um, comfortable enough to think that you know enough or you have to stop learning. Um, but I think I am of course, way more comfortable now. Like even my first four months, um, I was not comfortable at all. In March, I issued paid, I think, almost 50,000, 49.9. I was not comfortable at any of those appointments. I, I, I still felt like I didn't know enough and I was making mistakes and I was saying the wrong thing or, you know, it, it just, I am always striving because I am a perfectionist. I'm always striving to get better and better and better. Um, but I think it, it, 
and it's, it should be uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You have to embrace the ambiguity of not knowing enough and being able to lean on your upline and yeah. lean on the other people yeah. around you. Yeah. So I still when like I was in a home today and I, I had to send Mike a text and say, hey, I don't, I don't know what to do in this situation. And I'm like, damn, man, I, you know, I've issue paid a whole bunch, but I still I still have to call and ask questions uh, when I don't know something. And I'm OK with that. Yeah. I mean, another thing too, like everyone works together. So, like, if you have a situation where you, you know, you know, need to ask someone a question, your mentor or you know, people that you, that you work with are there, you know, for you, right? So, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. one team, one fight. Like, and the it's one thing for people to help you when they have a financial interest in you being successful, because the more you're successful, the more they're going to be successful. Um, so, I know if I call Alex or Mike, they're going to stop what they're doing to help me. Um, but when I call somebody like Brian Beasley, he's just another random dude on our team. If I call Paige, she's just a random person on the team. If I call Gina, Gina has zero financial interest in helping me, but she stops what she's doing and people will help me. Like if they're with a client, I get it. Yeah. But right after they're done, people call me back. And it's amazing that people are willing to pour into me, which is why I will stop whatever I'm doing to help anybody I can. Um, because so many people have poured into me to make me successful. Yeah. Cool. That's really, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking that. I'm sure that's pretty cool. You know, um, <clears throat> I have to give a shout out to Lily. So Lily, she's a, one of our brand new agents. She's getting ready to retire herself from the military and out of Virginia and come back to North Carolina. So she's really getting out the gate and really learning this stuff. So she ran into a situation for a 30, I think 30 something year old di type one diabetic and all the things she was coming up with the underwriting guidelines really didn't give her a lot of options. And um, so she texted me, hey, I got this person. I said, why don't you give Forrester's a call doing do an underwriting risk assessment on term life on um, your term because it's fully underwritten. Someone who's got diabetes, you know, um, type one diabetes, they're probably willing to take a risk on them. They'll probably rate it up, et cetera. But she didn't really know that until she texted me. Now she has a, a really great potential opportunity to serve a client with a, a great product, but, you know, never assume that the limited knowledge that you have and the limited tools that you have is going to be enough. Always check upline with your upline manager, people that know more and they can guide you because maybe what you came up with is maybe the right thing, but maybe it isn't. Maybe the, you don't know enough. And that's what Kevin's really alluding to is that, you know, never assume, you know, everything. I don't assume I know everything. I check. I always check myself on a lot of stuff, right? So um, anyway, any other questions from my man, Kevin? All right. Well, you know they have a fort named after you, right, Kevin? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've been there. I took a picture in front of the sign. All right. <laughs> so, dude... Give us some closing parting comments to, you know, people are, are probably really impressed with your story. They're, they're all looking forward to meeting you at NatCon, I would hope. And um, so give us some parting nuggets, dude. Um, just a couple things. One, don't be afraid to fail. Like I sucked at the beginning and I still uh, was su successful my first month um, because I didn't care uh, if I failed. Like I knew that that failure was going to make me better. And I wasn't going to make those same mistakes over and over again. Um, and at least to the second point is be coachable, be willing to say, hey, I don't know enough to know enough. And I got to ask questions. And then the third and probably the most important is get to the conference, get around other people who are going to pour into you to help make you successful. And when you do get to the conference, come up and see me. I love to meet new people. I love to talk. Um, it, it, it just can't be matched, uh, you know, getting getting to a conference and then seeing the benefits and the results immediately afterwards. Um, my, my big March was a direct result of freaking, you know, NatCon. Yeah. My September was a big result of breakthrough. So, you know, I can attribute all of my successes directly to some of these events and it, it wouldn't have happened had I not gone. Yeah. And, you know, it's not enough just to go and be a bump on the wall, actually interact with people. So I'm, I'm working on that myself. Um, but you know, ask questions, ask hard questions, um, and, and don't be afraid to meet new people. Yeah. That's awesome. Let's get dude. it. 
Well, thank you, Kevin. By the way, what is your website for your bow ties? Uh, uh, honestly, we uh, we do not have a website. They are all custom made to order, so it's all word of mouth. Um, oh, wow. You have to know somebody to to be able to get in. But, oh, you um, got to do that boutique <laughs> thing, man! I love it. Yeah, so you're, you're special if you have one of Kevin's bow ties. Like you're, That's you kind of got the underground network thing happening. Yeah, That's they're all one about. of a kind, bro. I'm gonna hit you up, man. <laughs> Let me know. I okay. got you. <laughs> I know you do. Gang, you heard it from the man, the myth, the legend. I'm just so proud and I'm humbled it. And thank you, Lord, that he's in my team. <laughs> <laughs> but you're just your willingness to serve and give to other people, man. It just rocks. So, man, anything I can do for you, you know, you know, you can call on me. And um, God bless, man. You rock. Thanks, yes, sir. Tell your lovely Thanks wife. I said, hey. <laughs> Will do. Okay. Y'all have a blessed evening. All right. Bye -bye. Take care, buddy. God bless. See you.